Our next speaker is Mr. David Childers. David is the Vice President of Keeping Current Matters, and he's really in charge of the, the department that puts out all the information, all the amazing visuals and blog posts and information that you guys are seeing that I see a ton of you sharing out with your networks every single day. And so with that, I'd like to introduce you guys to Mr. David Childers. What's going on, David? Thanks, Nick. Uh, it's, a, it's a good day. Thanks for having me back. I'm excited about uh, spending a few minutes together. Yeah, absolutely. Definitely. You were by far and away the uh, number one speaker that people enjoyed hearing from when we did the 2020 Conclave virtual version, you know, inside of the Legion. And wow. so, man, it's an, honor to, it's an honor to have you back for sure. You guys are so on top of the market, man. So I know that it's going to be really valuable. Well, I, I appreciate you saying that. We've got a, a big team that does all the research work that you mentioned and writes, you know, what we put out. So I'll definitely relay that to them. Uh, you know, I think the, you know, I'm excited to be here today. I saw, you know, you had so, so many great speakers kicking off the day with Renee, ending the day with Jim. You know, I'm a big, big fan of Jim's and, you know, having this relevant market opinion, being able to say, this is what we see happening in the market uh, is what we got to do today. So I, I'm excited to spend time together. Tell me how much time uh, do we have? We're kind of between here and the bottom of the hour. Yeah, basically. Yeah. 25 minutes or so, 25, 30 minutes. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. So ready to hop in or how yes, we go? Yeah, right. we're ready. So I, I'm going to go ahead and share here, Nick, and just let me know that you can see that and uh, we'll kind of be off to the races. Yep, it looks great. You see that? All right, cool. So uh, again, Nick, thank you for having me back. Uh, and thank you to everybody you know, that's watching today or maybe you're watching it after the fact uh, for investing just a couple of minutes to to listen to to what you know our team has found about uh, about this market and you know everything kind of going on now that we're several weeks into it. I know we talked what it was three or four weeks ago. Um, and I brought kind of four questions. Uh, one, when is the economy going to recover? Uh, and spoiler alert there, I'm not going to have a date for you, but I'm going to give you some of the research that's, that's uh, you know, kind of in that area. Uh, two, are we going into a recession? I know, you know, certainly from a, a loan officer's perspective, there are a lot of folks that are very educated on this topic. Um, and I'm going to give you some things maybe to take this to your realtor partners or, or to put out there in the market to help people understand it that maybe aren't as educated on this topic. Um, three, we talked about this last time. I have a couple of updates, you know, on this question, is this 2008 all over again? Uh, and four, what about all these job losses? So with that as kind of a backdrop, we will, we will kind of hop in and, uh, and kind of kick this off with when is the economy going to recover? So but let, let's look at this real quick. This is the most up-to-date uh, forecast that major financial institutions are calling for recovery. And see kind of this V-shape. This was um, as of 4.15. Today is the 20th. We're five days after this. Things are moving very fast. We update this information as we have it. So what you see is you see the four major institutions that we're following right here that have projected this throughout the year, Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, Morgan Stanley, and Wells Fargo, calling for you know downturn here in the first quarter, which that'll be uh, released here in the next week by the end of the month. And then the sharp decline down in the second quarter um, with a rebound in the second half of the year, what they would call at this point a V-shaped recovery. So let's talk about recoveries real quick. There's three predominant recoveries that, that you want to look for. There's a, a V-shape, which is this down and then back up. I imagine if you had a tennis ball and you threw it down and it shot back up. There's this U-shaped recovery, which is we go down and we stay down longer than this, this rapid you know, jump back up. And then what we don't want is an L-shaped recovery, which is down and then uh, we stay down. You know, If you had that tennis ball and an L-shaped recovery, it's a dead tennis ball. You throw it down and it, it stays there and rolls off. And so what we're seeing right now as far as forecasts from major financial institutions is this V-shaped recovery. Now we're watching that to see, okay, what does that look like? What are they saying? It really, you know, you can see here Wells Fargo saying, well, maybe in the third quarter, we're gonna see negative GDP. Uh, three out of the four are saying positive, but we're staying on top of that to be able to give you that information. But suffice it to say, the second half of the year, financial institutions, major financial institutions, see positive uh, growth in GDP. So I pulled a quote from, from Goldman Sachs and it says, if policymakers manage to thread the needle, important word right there, between continued virus control and the gradual reopening of the economy, 
the level of GDP should begin to move higher in the months ahead. So what do we know right now? We're in this process of, you know, can we get back to work? How do we get back to work? When do people feel comfortable going out? And there's that thread the needle analogy. It's gonna to be tough to do. And we know it's gonna vary from state to state, from area to area, town to town, on what can we do to, you know, to the level of severity of, of outbreaks and things like that with COVID-19. But suffice it to say that as we do that, the levels of production should grow. We should be able to, to release, um, uh, you know, to go back to work and businesses get back to, to work. I want to bring in next, what are business owners saying about this right now? And this is a, uh, a study we've been following that they continue to update uh, from Price Waterhouse Coopers of 50 leaders from a cross section of industries that were asked if it were to end today, how long would it take you to get your business back up and running? And what we saw when this, this study first came out in the middle of March is that um, six out of 10 said within 30 days, nine out of 10 said certainly within 90 days. And then you saw that you know, digress as we went on from nine out of 10 to really seven out of 10 uh, to now six out of 10 saying, Hey, I'd be ready within 90 days. So, so certainly, you know, business owners not feeling as confident, but the majority of them still saying within 90 days, within the three months, we would be back to business as usual. So it's an interesting look at the, um, at what financial institutions are forecasting and then what business leaders are thinking. So next I wanna pull in, you know, kind of a perspective on what does this mean to home prices? We're starting to see some forecasts being done and projections being done. Uh, one that we follow is the Z Report, which Ivy Zellman uh, founded. If you're not familiar with Ivy, she is a leading um, a forecaster and analysis analyst in our business that you know, gives a lot of information to hedge funds and larger companies about the housing market. And she says, Supported by our analysis of home price dynamics through cycles and other periods of economic and housing disruption, we expect home price appreciation to decelerate, not depreciate, but decelerate from current levels in 2020, though easily remain in positive territory year over year, given the beneficial factors of record low inventories and a historically low interest rate environment. So, so what is she saying there? that while we may not see the appreciation this year that we thought we would see, we will not see depreciation uh, in home values, largely given the, the inventory scenario and, and rate scenario that we find ourselves in. If I were to compare her projections, which we did to pre-COVID-19 to post-COVID-19, you can see those there where prior to, to going into this, this crisis, uh, they were projecting for 2020 about 4.7% appreciation in the housing market, and that's been updated to 3%. Uh, after that, uh, in 2021, you can see there's an uptick in, in appreciation. They were originally calling for about 3.8% appreciation, and now that's 42 and they had not yet forecasted uh, 2022, and are saying that looks like 4.6%. So what you notice about that graph there is there are no red bars. There's no depreciation, something, something key to remember there. Um, I dropped this in just as a quick reminder. I know we get a lot of requests for slides. If you go to keepingcurrentmatters.com forward slash coronavirus, a lot of this is there. You can grab stuff there uh, if you need it. So this, this next question, are we going into a recession? So uh, like I, I mentioned before, a lot of people here know the technical definition of recession, two consecutive quarters with negative GDP. Um, we're certainly looking at first quarter uh, being projected as being negative. Uh, and we'll confirm that when that comes out. Second quarter uh, being significantly negative. So yeah, I, I think it is safe to say we are in a recession now. They're, technically, we'll probably wait till the end of the second quarter to, to call that. But uh, recession is nothing more than an economic slowdown. And what do we know that's happening um, from you know businesses that we interact with, from places that we live, we know the economy has slowed down based on this pause button that's been hit. But, but what we know we can, can confidently say as well is recession does not equal housing crisis. Um, recession means economic slowdown, not necessarily housing crisis. And I pulled this quote from Mark Fleming at First American. It says, many still bear scars from the Great Recession and may expect the housing market to follow a similar trajectory in response to the coronavirus outbreak but there are distinct differences to indicate the housing market may follow a much different path 
And while housing led the recession in 2008 and 2009, this time it may be poised to bring us out of it. So we know that when we mention recession, consumers hear this is 2008 all over again. And I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Um, but what we know is that while our business was literally at the middle uh, of the economic downturn in 2008, um, this time with low uh, inventory across the country and with the economic impact that happens uh, at the purchase of a home and construction of a home and sale of a home, uh, we are poised as an industry to help pull our economy out. Uh, and that's important to remember. Um, the next quote I pulled was from Doug Bryan, um, who's CEO of Mine Property Management, kind of a consulting firm. Uh, it says, with the exception of two recessions, the Great Recession from 2007, 2009, and the Gulf War Recession from 1990 to 1991, no other recessions have impacted the U.S. housing market, according to the Freddie Mac Home Price Index. And that comes from data collected all the way back to 1975. So when we go all the way back to 1975 to today, and we look at recessions across this country and their impact on, on home prices, there are two that stand out as being um, showing depreciation. One is 2008, which we all remember. Uh, the other is in 1991. Uh, if we look back, there were actually five recessions during that time, three of those five, we saw appreciation uh, during that actual recession. So that came out from Freddie Mac and the Home Price Index. Uh, this is a graphical representation from CoreLogic, and it, and it lines up with what, uh, what we just read. We all remember 2008, close to 20% depreciation, but then when we look at the four recessions prior to that, only one, 1991, saw depreciation. So interesting graphic to get out in the market. You may have seen this before, but I, would, I always say this, don't fall to the, um, the curse of knowledge, meaning you may know it, but, but the clients that you serve may not know it and most likely don't know it. Maybe referral partners that you do business with may not know it. And so uh, keeping that in mind is, uh, is big. So I think we're making, making decent time here, Nick. I'm going to try to continue to fly through this so that we get all this in, uh, but certainly can, can take questions as well. Uh, the third question, is this going to be like 2008 and, and this you know, housing collapse all over again? I want to run through a few quick graphs. I, I think we talked about these last time, a couple of edits, a couple of updates to those so that we can, can really bring the visual component to simply and effectively see differences uh, in today's market versus back then. First one is home price appreciation. You can see here on this graph, the left is the six years leading up to the crash, uh, the right, the six years leading up to today. And just visually, you can tell there's a big difference. Uh, leading up to 2008, the, the housing crash, we had uh, what I would call runaway appreciation. And, and you know what happens there? It's like a runaway train. It's not gonna end anything. It's not gonna end up good. Um, and what we have today, or what we've seen leading up to today, while we have appreciation, we don't have it to the level uh, that we had back then. So, so important to, to remember with regard to appreciation. Um, the second one, I'll fly by this pretty quick, quickly, the Mortgage Bankers Association Mortgage Credit Availability Index. Um, if there's anybody that knows uh, the availability of credit and the situation with that today, it's everybody on this call. And the higher this index, the easier it is to get a loan. So we can see back in the housing bubble when we know in our business is very easy uh, to obtain financing, then we had this pendulum swing that made it much harder to, harder to uh, obtain financing. Guidelines got harder, self-employed got higher, harder, all the things we know about our business. And we've largely stayed there in a lot of places. And we even know today, right now, that credit is, you know, is constricting as well um, in, in a lot of places for people to obtain financing. The next big piece that we want to look at, and this is an update to I think what we talked about last time, are uh, the months of inventory on, on the market uh, today versus back then. And this, this, this graph does such a good uh, example just visually to get it. And if we kind of take this neutral market or six, seven month window as a neutral market, and we compare last, uh, you know, last recession in 2008 to today's market, we know that we had a significant oversupply of homes on the market uh, in 2008, which led to a lot of the problems that we faced as an industry and, and really as a, as a country. And what do we know about today? Many in the real estate business, certainly uh, buying and selling real estate, the biggest challenge they uh, face are literally the number of homes on the market, an undersupply of homes for the number of people that want to buy them. 
largely across the country. Now that's going to vary by market to market and by price point. I know that. Um, but this is a, this is a stark difference that I don't want to just, just fly past in the difference between where we at, where we at today as an industry to, to where we, uh, you know, were back then. The next piece here, we talked about this last time, the total number of equity cash outs, you know, cash out refinances done the three years prior uh, to 2008 and the, to the three years prior to today. And what we know is leading up to, to 2008, we had $824 billion done as cash out refis. An interesting thing I'll, I'll tell you about this leading up to today, the total of the last three years does not even equal or exceed the total of one year leading up to 2008. Significantly different in how consumers are handling equity in their homes today versus back then. And, and I think it's fair to say there are a lot of people that learned a lot of lessons about equity uh, back then that they don't want to repeat. Let me take a quick break here. Speaking to the way that, uh, that, that folks are treating uh, their homes right now. So the next piece, and I've updated this slide as well, when you start to talk about uh, wealth in this country, this is significant. 53.8% of all homes in America have at least 50% equity. Uh, we know, you can see on here, that 37% of the homes in this country are owned free and clear. Uh, we then take the balance of that that do have a mortgage, and the, when you take the portion that has 50% equity, you come with that 53.8% number. We also know the average equity of a home with a mortgage on it is $177,000 today. And so when we saw the situation where people were walking away from homes where they literally owed more on them than they were worth in 2008, by and large, we don't have that scenario today. We have a lot of equity in homes across this country. So let's, let's kind of End on this fourth question, uh, what about all of those job losses? It's the question that's on a lot of people's minds right now, you know, uh, after the last few weeks of, of unemployment claims. And it's the, the topic today, I, I copied out of here um, a, a copy of the KCM blog today. And if you haven't read it, I'd say go over to kcmblog.com, go check it out. And we were, we're writing blogs every single day on a current you know, topic with regard to this market. It says the pain of unemployment, it will be deep, but will not last long. So let me kind of unpack that for just a minute, the pain of unemployment. So no doubt if you're on this call today um, and, and just Nick, the number of people that you uh, have influence with, you know, you've, you've probably known somebody if, if not felt the pain of unemployment and, and we're seeing some significant uh, uh, unemployment right now, greater in the last few weeks than we've ever seen in this country. Now, we talk about two things when it comes to unemployment. We're going to talk about depth, so meaning how many people are unemployed, and then length for how long. So while we, we're saying this blog, it's going to be deep. There's going to be a lot of people that, that are unemployed through this. In perspective to history, it will not be as long as prior um, uh, unemployment scenarios. We've heard it compared. You know, People are saying, hey, this is going to be greater than, than the um, – than the you know housing collapse or great recession, and we're talking about you know this is going to be worse than the Great Depression. So I want to address some of those things in this. Okay, so let's kind of let's kind of start here with uh, weekly uh, unemployment claims. People that file for unemployment uh, each week. We know we started out uh, March there three point three million went you know went up six point nine six point six and last week uh, five point two, and, and we'll we'll get another number this week. So a tremendous amount of unemployment, tremendous amount of people losing their jobs. Now, while we do believe um, these are jobs that are being lost right now um, due to the pause, that's, the pause button that's been pressed in the economy, not due to fundamental issues in industry or with the economy, um, that, that we will see those jobs come back. Now, I'm not saying that everybody, every one of those jobs are going to come back, you know, when, when restaurants open or is every single server going to get hired back? Is every single you know, situation in the job going to be replaced? Maybe not, probably not. Um, but we know a lot of those uh, will. So let's compare um, these job losses to the Great Recession. This is telling. So what we know right now, and this number is going to go higher, um, is we have 22 million people that have filed for these initial uh, unemployment claims. The number of jobs created, just to put that in perspective, 
The number of jobs created over the last 10 years, really since the Great Recession, is 24.8. We'll likely surpass that coming up here real soon. Um, and, and while, again, these jobs have been created, they, these haven't gone away fundamentally. These will come back when the economy comes back. It just gives you comparison. You see in the middle there, the 22 million where we stand today. On the right, the 8.7 million was the peak uh, or the number of jobs losses through the Great Recession. And so we're looking at a number here of multiples higher than that. So the reason I bring that up is just to give you perspective when somebody says, well, three times as many people or whatever number are losing their jobs today as compared to 2008. They're right. They're right. And job loss is significant. But fundamentally, what we want to look at is what caused those job losses and how long are they predicted to last. So I'm going to kind of kind of wrap with a, with a couple of slides here. The first is 2020 unemployment rate forecast. So let's look at what are major institution, institutions forecasting unemployment to be. See on the left here, Goldman Sachs at 15%. Uh, Merrill Lynch at 10%, J.P. Morgan 85 and Wells Fargo at 7%. So if we look at this, we took um, Goldman Sachs projection at 15%, and then they, they, they kind of give a projection for three years uh, kind of going out, and we graphed that against the Great Recession and the Great Depression to give you perspective on the unemployment scenario. So let's, let's kind of wrap here on this slide. It says more depth, less length. I want to focus your, your eyes to the top line here where you see two years, nine years, and 12 years. In black, we have the COVID-19 projections, the most conservative meaning the highest projections. Uh, in brown is the Great Recession, and red is the Great Depression. So what you want to look at is you want to look at depth, meaning the number of people that lose their jobs, and you want to look at the length. And let's be clear, length is much more important than depth. And so in this, you see us in that hitting the 15% mark that Goldman Sachs has projected. That's the Goldman Sachs projections. But what this signifies is where did we start, where were we at before, and how long does it take us to get back there? Now, Goldman Sachs is saying, hey, we're starting at 15% this year, and then it's going to take us two years to get back to where we were. So it's not going to, you know, we're going to flip a light switch on and, uh, and all of this is going to be over and everybody gets their job back and we just go back to life as, as normal. I think we all know there's some things that got to be figured out. But when we compare that to the, to the length of the Great Recession, we're nowhere near it, where it took us nine years to get back to prior unemployment numbers from, from 2008. And, but, but what we see is much more depth. So the, the equivalent of this is, you know, you want somebody to come up and, and uh, maybe, maybe, you know, hit you in the back of the head and knock you down or just come and just, you know, hit, hit you for a while. Um, and, and, and what would you, what would you prefer there to get it over with or, or what? And so a different scenario there with regard to the Great Recession. And then you compare it to the Great Depression. Uh, nowhere near in depth or in length. Could, could the 15% be revised from today? Absolutely those projections more than likely will be revised. Um, now, will it go higher, will it go lower? I don't know, I don't have a crystal ball. But, but to compare this to the Great Depression, or some people have you know, said that maybe in, you know, um, uh, it, it, this does not frame up anywhere near what we saw in the Great Depression of year after year of 20 plus percent in this country of unemployment. Matter of fact, it took 12 years to get back to where, uh, where we were. So. That gives a little bit of perspective to the employment piece, not saying people aren't going to be uh, affected by that, not saying it's, you know, um, everything's going to come back on right, right when the economy starts to come back online. It's going to take, take some time, but, but this will give you perspective to how, how that all works. Um, so, so, Nick, I'll, I'll wrap with this. I, I gave you the it's keepingcurrentmatters.com uh, forward slash coronavirus. If you want to, you know, become a KCM member or go check things out that we do, you can go to trykcm.com. Certainly, um, anybody that wants to be a part of that, we'd love to have you on this journey that we're on. But, uh, but I'm just glad to get a chance to, to spend a few minutes with you and, uh, and talk about what's, what's happening in the market so that, you know, we can help uh, you help the clients that you serve 
um, make a difference. Be, feel confident about buying or selling a home or refinancing a home or you know, doing something uh, with regard to our business. So um, I'll pause there for a second, Nick. Uh, any questions, anything? I tried to run through that as fast as I could. And so forgive me if I, if I went too fast, but I wanted to get through all that because it's important stuff. Yeah, no, that was all definitely awesome. There was one, one question I saw. Uh, mm-hmm. I was just trying to see if I could go back and find it real quick. Sure. Basically, the question was about Q1 and if the GDP, okay, so it says there hasn't been an announcement yet that Q1 yeah. had a negative GDP. Sure, Will that sure. announcement come out? And why is the market doing pretty well with everything going on? <laughs> um, there's, there's, there's a couple things. So I would pause the second question for this afternoon with Jim. Let's let him answer that. I'll give you a sneak peek into it. Um, so GDP is released. So like in the first quarter, January, February, March, that is released at the end of April, the month following. So that's going to come out the, you know, next week. At this point, that is still a forecast. So we don't have GDP for the first quarter. So if that answers the question there, Nick. So most people are saying, hey, due to the constriction in the economy, we will see a negative number. Um, that's why it's a forecast at this point, but we won't know. And I think we all kind of go, well, that would be real surprising to me, you know, if, if, if we saw that. And then what, what, we're, what we're seeing forecasters project is this significant drop in the second quarter, you know, um, in, in production. So that's, that's kind of the answer there. I, I'll, I'll give the tease to this, but I do want you to, you know, ask uh, Jim that because he's much better in this area. Um, the, it's never the news. It's always the market's reaction to the news. So the interesting thing is we've seen the market, you know, and certainly volatility has been the name of the game, but largely we've seen, we've seen the largest um, unemployment numbers come out over the last few weeks and yet the markets has not responded, you know, and and tanked over it. So um, there there are a lot of, a lot of reasons by that, but Jim, Jim will give, I'll give a little tease to that. Jim will speak to that and, and, and can, can do it very eloquently. For sure. All right. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for, for jumping on here and being part of the Mortgage Living Legends Summit. I know KCM, I mean, you guys are just putting out amazing information. Definitely, if you guys aren't already trying it, you know, uh, go to trykcm.com and you can see how you can have your information added to the Keeping right. Current Matters uh, blogs and some of the content that they put out. Let's get some. Ready to get some. Like I said, life is always ready always to get some, ready. which is a good stand, thing. Stand by to get some. Stand by to get some. Hey there, everybody. What's up? Hey, I'm Len Herbert. Natalie Fallbach, New Mexico. This is Bill Somerville from South Florida. I'm Tammy Smith from Charlotte, North Carolina. Jason DuPont, Arizona. Glenda Meyer from San Diego. I'm Brian Carpenter from Texas. I'm Walter Parker from Colorado. Steve Marks from Hawaii. Hey, I'm Melinda Hip from Texas. I'm John Laster from Arkansas. I'm Josh Schenkel. Lodi, California. I'm Nick Carpenter from Colorado. This is uh, Boxless uh, Nathan Eichhorn from Colorado. I am the real Nick Carpenter. I'm Joe Wiggins from California. Joanna Perry from Sacramento, California. I'm Ty Starr in Oregon. This is Marvin Yona from San Diego. I'm Jeff Van Nostren in Seattle, Washington. Hey Nick, uh, Nathan Eichhorn here in uh, Parker, Colorado. I uh, wanted to just send you a quick note and thank you. Uh, since joining the Legion, uh, I've been able to branch out on my own, start my own independent brokerage, uh, quick start lending, and triple my business. And that's in the last six months since uh, joining and following your advice. So thank you very much.